My guest this week is a special gentleman. He's the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship in Canada. He's the Member of Parliament for York Southwestern. He's a man who went to Canada at age 15 as a refugee. By the year 2015, he was sitting as an MP. And 2017, he became the first Canadian Somalian to be appointed to the cabinet. First Canadian Somalian also to sit in the House of Commons. A gentleman who has more than history making about him, studied history at university, has a law degree as well, and is a decent chap from all accounts. My guest, Ahmed Hussein. Minister, welcome to the conversation. Sir. Thank you for having me. Appreciate Excellent. It. I guess the place to start, and we, we, we have some things to cover, yeah. Jamaicans in Canada and the, the, yeah. the Caribbean presence and black Canadians and all of that. Okay. I think the place I want to start is this. Canada still opens its door to doors to refugees yeah. in a way that its neighbor across the north does not, and in a way that the leading lights in Europe are quarreling over and uh, which precipitated the Brexit vote, which has still not been resolved because Theresa May and her government haven't had a position that the parliament has found a favor with. So I guess with that as the basis, why is Canada going against the grain, welcoming people to come to be a part of integrated Canada to help the country to grow? I think it's because of the uh, makeup of Canada. Apart from our indigenous brothers and sisters, the story of modern Canada is really the story of immigration various people who've come uh, either from uh, hundreds of years ago to decades ago to years ago who have all uh, left their homelands for various reasons some have left uh, in search of safety and security away from persecution others have left uh, in search of a better opportunity for themselves and for their families mm -hmm. and so that is the makeup of, of modern Canada and uh, it has helped us to appreciate the positive impact that immigrants have on our economy, on our society. And, uh, and I always say the whole world is in Canada. Mm -hmm. We have uh, somehow figured out a way to not only welcome people from all corners of the world, but to actually integrate them mm -hmm. and equip them with the tools that they need to succeed in their new country. That has really meant not only success for themselves, but really success for Canada. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, I can tell you in the world today, for example, talent is very mobile. Yes. People don't have to go to a particular country. Yes. And so the decisions they make in, in terms of where they go uh, ultimately sometimes comes down to how, how welcome they feel. Mm -hmm. And in that uh, particular context, I think Canada is doing well because people feel that when they come to Canada, they'll be welcomed, they'll be embraced, and they'll be free to be who they are. Yeah. And that's a key point. But what, it is, what is it, Minister, about Canada's appreciation for what people can bring to the country? Yeah. Canada's appreciation for what greater integration can bring, the benefits thereof. Yes. What is it that Canada has seen in these two areas that the rest of the developed world is struggling to see? Well, I think it's also a question of having an infrastructure of welcome. Many countries are trying to get into this uh, situation where they, 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 you know, you will you will see a lot of politicians who will say in parts of the world, you know, these immigrants are not integrating. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they they're not being part of the society. And and the the point I always make is that integration, you have to invest in integration. Yes, you have to equip newcomers with the opportunities to learn the language, to find work. To, you have to support them initially. And then they will not only succeed but give back. So integration really is a, is a journey. Yes. And pe different people have different journeys. Refugees, for example, their journey of integration and settlement is a little bit longer. But they also make a, a huge contribution to Canadian society. And, and so when you look at it like that, you realize that those who spread fear and, uh, and misinformation about immigrants are actually against their nation's interest. Mm. Because in many parts of the world, including Europe, uh, there's a labor shortage. Yes. You know, there's a skills shortage. There's a population decline. You need, in an aging society like Canada, but many other industrialized societies as well, you need the injection of, of labor to meet the needs of the economy. You need people who will come and re revitalize local communities. And so immigration can be a, a really important positive uh, positive. Uh, mechanism to really encourage all of that. Now, there are some irresponsible politicians who will use immigration 
to try to score points and to win an election or two. Mm -hmm. But can I tell you something? Fear mongering and fear never created a job. Yeah. You can win an election uh, based on fear, but you won't, you won't be able to, to sustain that program. What you need is a, a way to balance the interests of your citizens in protecting the safety and security of your citizens by, of course, being um, very vigilant at the border and uh, ports of entry and not compromising there, yes. but also being open and welcoming to those who would be kind enough to t lend you their talents. Yes. Because, you know, the person who's coming to add their skills to Canada has been educated somewhere else. Yes. So we're benef it, it's an You asset. didn't invest in their development. No, we didn't. But you're certainly benefiting from their expertise. From their expertise, yes. but, but we recognize that um, even though we didn't invest in them initially, we're helping them, we're investing in them as newcomers in Canada yes. to enable them to succeed further. Absolutely. So let me give you an example. There may be, a, you know, there's a, an example of a woman recently who Canada welcomed through a strategy that our government introduced called the Global Skills Strategy. Mm -hmm. This woman is a very highly skilled uh, a software engineer from Pakistan. The issue there is that she had reached her limit in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And the Pakistani ecosystem in terms of software engineering just didn't allow her to go to the next level. Yes. Uh, so, so she came to Canada and used our immigration system, yes, to help Canada, but to also help herself. Yes. Because if she had stayed in Pakistan, <clears throat> she wouldn't have gone to that uh, ultimate level. So the ecosystem there, uh, because we've allowed so many talented people to come, it's created an ecosystem for robotics, for artificial intelligence, for software engineering and, and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is in turn attracting investment. I'll give you an example. The Global Skills Strategy is a program that was brought in by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government. Uh, and in, in recently, in June 2017, that program has allowed uh, highly skilled workers. You know, there are people who are very highly skilled, much in demand in certain niche sectors. Yes. Whereby, if you're a business person and you bring in that individual, you will grow your, your company and business and create dozens of jobs yes. for Canadians. Yes. So it's not a zero sum game. Yeah. You bring one highly skilled immigrant, but you create it's 50, a real multiplier. 50 yeah. to 100 jobs yeah. for Canadians. Yeah. So, but the problem is in the past, we didn't look at it like that. Yeah. We saw it as this person is displacing a Canadian. Yeah. Yeah. So it used to take a long time to prove that point. And uh, under the different systems required to bring this person, it would take seven months to process their applications. We've streamlined that to 10 business days. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, 15,000 of the most highly skilled people in the world have come to Canada. Yes. 25% of them are, are Americans. Yes. We, there was a time when Canadian talent would go south. Yes. Now it's coming north. Yes. And each one of them, on average, has created 10 jobs. That's 150,000 jobs, approximately, from one immigration program yeah. within the largest immigration program. So it, it works. Yeah. So, so, so on, on the point of it working, you know, I still see, in some respects, Minister, mm -hmm. Canada almost like the proverbial oasis in the desert. Because if you take the example of the Balkan states, there are people, there are countries where the people look like them, but your ethnicity may be different. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, we don't want him here, or we don't want her here, or we don't want that family sure, here. Sure. And they're, they're, the, the profile of the country is made up of displaced persons, persons from diverse ethnicities and backgrounds, as Canada is. Yeah. Not, across the board, your neighbors, we're seeing the growth of far-right parties, the far-right ideology is healthy. Well, it's unhealthily healthy in Europe. So the question is, why is it that Canada can be able to reconcile with the need to give people of good character, people of skills, people of ambition, the facility to help the country grow, help the persons to, help the, the, the individuals to self-actualize as the, in the example of the yeah. Pakistani woman you just mentioned. Yes. Why is it that you, you've been able to nail this down while others who have your same background, a similar history, are struggling to see that and are even going down the road of doing the opposite? I think, uh, first of all, we're not immune to the rising anti-immigrant. But, but it's uh, nowhere narrative. near as fervent no, or as fervent in it, your country but, as but it is. It is affecting us. Yes. And it, it's, you know, there are people who are gravitating towards that. And fortu uh, fortunately, it's not the majority, of yeah. course. Uh, but I think it's also the makeup of Canada. 
some of these other societies are steeped in history and, 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 and they don't have a critical mass of an immigrant population. In the case of Canada, I mean, my, one of my colleague ministers, who I always assumed was, was Canadian from generations ago, mm -hmm. told me the other day that his grandfather fled Ireland, the, the Irish uh, War of Independence, and he fled to, uh, to Canada. Mm -hmm. And he was injured, and the only country that would take him was Canada. Yes. So this is a, a long tradition of, uh, of welcoming others, and in turn, he is now, of course, open and sympathetic to, to all newcomers, including refugees. Yes. Because he recognizes that, you know, the, son, the grandson of an Irish refugee is now a cabinet minister in Canada. Yes. That's him. Yes. So, of course, he's not going to be uh, uh, cynical about new refugees that yes. are coming in now because he sees in them uh, an example of what his grandfather yes. had to go through. And he, he will try as much as possible to support me and the Canadian government to do better with these refugees. But I also think it's, it's a question of deliberate public policy. policy yeah. Over a billion dollars invested every year on integration programs, mm -hmm. settlement programs, language training, help finding a job, mm -hmm. help uh, f uh, with orientation, right? Uh, when 93% when of all newcomers to Canada can pick up English or French very quickly, yes. it's because of the programs yes. that we invest in. Yes. That enables them to integrate faster. 80, more than 85% of them finally take the last step of becoming Canadian citizens, even though they don't have to. Yes. So there is a deep sense of feeling like they belong. Absolutely so. On that point, let's take the break now and come back with our second segment. My guest, the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship in Canada. Ahmed Hussein, who has a fascinating personal story. You'll hear more about that after these.